and good. And is this actually on? Yeah, it sounds like it. So, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank Patrick for the invitation uh, to participate in the summer school. And um, I take the word school very seriously uh, when we talk about these, uh, these events um, because I like to teach. Uh, I think it's important that there be a real teaching element uh, to these events so that uh, you hear the latest, but you also have the, the basis to understand where that latest comes from. Um, so I've taken the choice of, of starting off with some lecture material that's very early material, not even mine. Um, if you remember, Patrick mentioned two seminal papers or seminal people in the field of impedance control. Uh, one is Neville Hogan, he's here, I'll allow him to speak for himself. Uh, the other was Emilio Bizzi. And uh, Emilio's not here, but uh, I was one of his students, and he's one of my heroes. So I will try and present uh, some of the work that went on in the late 70s, early 80s that um, inspired this whole field of impedance control uh, in the human and animal uh, work that uh, was done at that time. So uh, I'm going to start off, I think, fairly slowly. But the idea is to bring us together to have some sort of commonality uh, basis. So I'd well, like to know, uh, are there any roboticians here? Raise your hand. I think there's probably a lot. Is there any physiologists here? Uh, ah, well, okay. Then uh, the idea was to, to introduce uh, the, the different concepts in the context of trajectory control of you know, what are the roboticians doing, what is control theory, uh, what are the physiology of uh, control of our movements, and how do some of these things come together, how did they come together uh, during those studies some time ago. So this is the outline uh, <coughs> of my talk. I'll be talking about some of these fundamental concepts just to bring everybody up to speed, make sure we're using the same vocabulary, talking about bandwidth concepts like bandwidth, damping ratio, feed forward, feedback, and I'll also give a brief uh, refresher on what is the physiology, what are the elements of the human motor system that are important uh, that could be useful for uh, implementing uh, a biological uh, instance of one of these uh, controllers. And like I say, I think it's important, and I'll give you a historical perspective of uh, how some of these things uh, came about. So the problem that I'm interested in studying is how does the brain control movement? And so very simply is, what is the law that allows, or by which the brain decides to activate a muscle in a particular way in order to perform a desired movement? And so to start out, I'd like to pose this question in a very simple, fundamental manner. Uh, here's the, the thing that we want to control, the musculoskeletal system, your robot, what have you. And the idea is that if you generate a motor command, for instance, if you exert a force on the system, it'll move, and you'll get some time series of positions. That's the actual movement. Okay? And so, of course, what we're trying to understand is then, how do you invert that? How does the brain take some desired movement, what it would like to do, okay, what is the movement it would like the hand to follow, and what does it do, uh, how does it decide uh, what the motor command needs to be. So I'm going to take you back historically, not just to what's in the literature, but also to high school. Uh, if I take a very simple system, uh, a mass sitting here, and I want to make it move, what do I have to do? Please speak very loudly. Very, okay, you have to push it. So what does pushing mean? You have to exert a force. How much force? More than a friction, now let's pretend there's no friction. High school physics. Mass equals acceleration. Force, okay, F equals MA, so you remember that? So that's very simple. So if I know I want to accelerate this object, make it move, I can push with a certain force, make it accelerate. And then what happens once I've got it accelerating this way? If I want it to stop, what did Newton say? Okay, so you have to exert another force in the reverse direction in order to break it, so otherwise a, an object of movement will stay in movement. So uh, that's very simple. Uh, way to think of things, and you can call that uh, feed-forward control or uh, internal model control. Basically, you, you have your plant here, and what we said it was, it was just a mass. And we know the, the, uh, the dynamics of the system, F equals MA. And so what you can do 
uh, is invert that, and so what you can imagine that the brain is doing is calculating the forces necessary to generate the movement that you want, okay, and then sending those forces, those commands to the muscles in order to accelerate and decelerate the limb. So that's feed forward control. Is there another way? And I know you're mostly engineers, so I expect you to catch on very quickly. If I'm here and I want to be here, is there another simple way to generate the force that will get this object from here to there? I'm sorry? Okay, a virtual force. So what is the virtual force? A spring, so that's a good one. What does a spring do? Generates a force that is? I'm sorry? Proportional to? The difference between, you have to speak louder, I'm very hard of hearing, but still, I think you get the idea that you, a spring will generate a force that's proportional to the difference between where it is and where the rest length of the spring is. So another way to say that is if I want to be here and I can see that I'm here, I could apply a force that's proportional to the difference between where I am and where I want to be, right? Okay, and so by that I can imagine that the, the system will, will get to, I'll apply forces until I reach the system, until that error between where I am and where I want to be comes to zero. Okay, and so that's the concept of feedback control. What do I do? I measure where the system is. Here's my mechanical system. I measure where it is at any point in time. I feed that back here. I compare it to where I want to be at any point in time. I do some simple calculation, for instance, multiply it by constant, and that's going to be my motor command. All right, so we have these two simple concepts, uh, feed forward control where you have some internal model, you have some idea of what the dynamics of the system is and you invert that. The other one is you say, I don't care what the dynamics are so much, I'm just going to measure where I am, compare it to where I want to be and generating a force that's proportional to that difference and that should be, drive me to the position where I want to be. So okay, so that's pretty simple. Okay, but the question is then, how do we know what the biological systems are doing? Okay, how would you deduce, how would you test to see if a biological system is doing one of these things or the other? Or of course some uh, combination of the two, but for the next half hour, so let's just pretend that it should be one or the other. Okay, so the question we're asking here is, is a monkey when he's doing an arm movement using a form of feed forward control or a form of feedback control? So here's the experiments that were done uh, in the late 70s. Uh, you train a monkey to sit here, so we have a monkey sitting here in a chair and moving, he's able to move his arm like this, okay? And in front of the monkey, you have a set of target lights. And so the monkey is trained to say, when this tar target light turns on, to, to point towards that target and he gets a little bit of reward. And then another target light turns on and he moves to the other target, okay? And then it gets another reward and he's uh, able to do that for some time. Well, what these experimenters did uh, was that on random trials, there's on this axis that they can move their arm, there's a motor, okay? There's a servo motor, and that motor could be used to move the arm uh, without any uh, intervention of the, of the monkey. So the experimenters could move the arm to where they wanted it to be at any point in time, and the motor is quite strong, it could move very quickly. And so <coughs> what they did was, okay, so you have one light target light coming on here, but just before the light comes on, or about the same time the light comes on, the, the experimenters use the motor to move the arm already to that position. Okay? So before the monkey has a chance to react, he sees that the light comes on, we assume that the monkey is going to plan a movement to get to that target, but before he can actually start performing that movement, uh, the arm is already moved there by the motor. What should happen? What would happen if you assume that the system is working in feed-forward mode, meaning that the brain of the monkey, the monkey is pre-programming uh, <laughs> the forces to be applied in order to generate that movement. So here's the idea, here's the un unperturbed movement. So this is just the movement from here to here, this is time, this is the elbow angle, and at this moment the target turns on, okay, and what you can see is after some time course, because this is, nothing's instantaneous, the monkey makes the movement and ends up here at the target. So then in the experiment, what happens is uh, the, the experimenters turn on the motor to move the arm here. So, so far we move the arm here just at the same time that the target is coming on. Okay, and now the question I will ask you is if the monkey is doing feed forward control with respect to the forces applied to the arm, what should happen? Just say a little louder, but I think you're right. 
So it would move from here to where? Up farther. So the idea is if you're already here and you apply the same forces, then what you expect to happen is to the arm uh, <coughs> to move the same distance or some, some further distance away from whatever the starting point is, assuming that the monkey hasn't figured out what you did already. And if it's feedback control, what should happen? Sorry? Nothing. Nothing. It should just stay there, okay? Because there's no longer, there's already no difference between where I am and where I want to be. So the brain is just saying, okay, uh, let's just stay there. There's no force to be generated because there's no uh, force. Uh, there's no error between the desired and actual position. Yes? Let's pretend that it doesn't for the moment. You're right that the monkey can probably do that, but uh, let's pretend that it can't for the moment, and we'll come back to that in a second. Okay, yes and no. Uh, what I forgot to say is the monkey can't see the arm, okay? But on the other hand, perhaps the monkey can feel the arm, okay? But, uh, but anyway, let's, so this was the experiment that they, these, this group of investigators did to try and ask this question, uh, how is the young monkey making this sort of movement? Here's the actual data. So you have uh, the original movement where there was no perturbation applied by the motor, so you can see this similar to the blue line here. And you can see what happens here, which is exactly what you said might happen, is that the, uh, the, here is where the motor is turned on. Okay? And so this movement here is done by the motor, not really by the monkey. And what you can see this happen is typically the arm moved backwards towards the starting position and then moved up to uh, reach the final position. Here, and here's a couple examples. All right? So if I were to ask you the question, I, I'm forced you to make a choice. Is it feed forward or feed back control? Which would you choose? Combination. A combination. Why would it be a combination? Well, first of all, let's stick with say feed forward, feed back. But don't forget, I'm going to come back to you in a second then. So if it was feed forward, what do you expect to happen? Overshoot. So if you're starting here, as we said, if you're already here and you apply the same forces because you pre-programmed your forces, what you expect to happen is to go here, farther forward. That didn't happen at all here, at least not in these two examples. Okay. All right, so if I made you choose between feed forward and feedback, which of these does it look more like? Would you agree that it's more like feedback than feed forward? Okay, but then why would you say it's a combination of the two? What in the combination of the two would make it go backwards? Okay, but why would it bring it back? You're on the right track, but what would bring it back? To where? Why does it? I mean, the target is here. The target is here. Here. They're not further than the target, they're at the target. They do go down, but why do they go down? If you're doing feedback, you're already where you want to be. So why would, you, why would your feedback take you backwards? Which trajectory, okay. Or prediction. Okay, I'm going to go with that one, okay, <laughs> because that's my next slide, and then we'll talk about the other one. So here, is this is the idea, is that what we are sort of implicitly assuming is that when the target light came, light came on, that's exactly where the arm, this monkey wants the arm to be. And so if he's already there, we'll move backward. Uh, one of the ideas was instead of that, what's happening is what the brain is doing is programming a time series of desired positions. Okay, so it doesn't just jump. It says, at this point in time, I want to be here. At this point in time, I want to be here. At this point in time, I want to be here. And because of the delays in the feedback, loop and the uh, latency of the dynamical system, the actual arm does that more or less with some delay. What we, was supposed to be happening here is when the monkey's here, the set point of the servo system, the desired position where the monkey wants to be at this point in time is still only here. So the feedback mechanism would be generating force backwards to where the arm should be at that moment in time even though it's already as the target. Same thing here, it's being pushed back to this desired trajectory. At some point they cross, and now uh, the feedback system starts pulling you uh, towards the desired position. So this was one interpretation of the data uh, of how you could explain uh, why the monkey's 
one, were able to tame the target, even though they were already moved to the target. They didn't move further. They stayed on the target. And two, why they moved back. So this is a starting point. And uh, just to give you an outline of what I plan to talk about in the next half hour or so then, is this. Did Mother Nature do this analysis? Did Mother Nature study control engineering? And so we asked the questions. I want to cover a few things here. First of all, we talk about feed forward and feed uh, back control. Get some of the terms down with stiffness, damping, and so forth uh, to make sure we are all on the same page there. Then I'll do a brief review of what the physiology is. What is the, uh, the parts of the human body that can be used to do this? And then we'll talk about some of the early models of how the brain, how the nervous system is controlling these movements. So, we talked about feedback controller. Let's start with that. We said we're doing here, here's our plant. In this case, maybe it's just a mass. We have the plant system, the uh, mechanical system. You apply a force and that moves. And the idea is that if you measure the position and you compare it to where you want to be at any point in time, okay, and you multiply that by some game factor, then that would give you a, a, an applied force that will tend to move you towards your desired position, right? So this is the equation that describes that. First of all, there's a fundamental problem here if you remember your physics. Why does this not quite work? Why does it not do what you want to do? If the target jumps from zero position to some other position, uh, what's the system going to do? And does this equation remind you of anything? It came up earlier already. Spring? Okay. So what happens if you take a spring, an ideal spring, and you stretch it, and then you let it go? Okay, it's going to oscillate. So what's missing here is is some, uh, <coughs> some sort of damping. So this is, system is essentially equivalent to a hook's law spring, linear spring, and if you pull on the spring and you let it go, or if you suddenly change the rest tank, what you expect to happen is this system would start oscillating uh, pretty much without end if you ignore any sort of friction. So what's important to the system is to add a damping element of some sort, some way to dissipate some of the energy. And so that can be depicted like this. You can also assume that you're measuring the velocity and feeding that back. And so if you're moving forward, there'll be some resistance uh, proportional to your forward velocity that's going to break the, the movement. Okay, and that can be described here. You have a term that's proportional to the difference between where you are and where you want to be. And you also have another term that is proportional to the velocity of the movement at any time. And so this system has uh, <coughs> uh, more uh, nicer qualities here. We have the original system if there was no damper here. If there's no damper, B is equal to zero. That's what we had before, where you have these oscillations that should go on without end. If you add this damping term, this term that's proportional to velocity, then you can see that the system may oscillate at the beginning, but eventually those oscillations will uh, go up. And just then to bring everyone up to speed, to remind you of these things, we can ask the question, well, what happens when you change those gain factors? If you change the position gain or you change uh, the velocity gain. So here we start out of a system that <clears throat> for constant stiffness, if you increase, if you start here with this green line, which is a moderately damp system, you'll get some oscillations and they'll uh, eventually uh, damp out. If you turn down the, uh, the velocity gain, if you have low damping, then you can expect to have more oscillations, okay, and they'll last for a longer time. And if you have very high damping, if you're moving through molasses, and you, this is an overdamp system, and there may not be any oscillations at all, it'll just take the system a long time to get to uh, the final target position. Okay, and you can just invert that for if you have a constant damping, you can see increasing the stiffness increases the responsiveness of the system, but it also increases its tendency to oscillate, okay? But you can speed up a slow sy system by increasing its stiffness. Uh, if you do some control theory, you can uh, talk about how you can modulate those two things together and get predictable behavior, what's called the damping ratio. I won't talk about exactly where that comes from, but you can see here, for a given damping ratio, if you have a damping ratio that's less than one, what you expect to see is some oscillations that last a certain amount of time, but the higher the stiffness for the same damping ratio, you'll get uh, oscillations, you'll get a system that responds more quickly than for a system that is low stiffness for the same damping ratio, you'll get a system that responds more slowly. And even if it's over damped where you have no oscillations, you get the same.
here is higher than it is here or here, but you also notice what goes on here is while it's being stretched, the activity is even higher. Okay? And while it's being released, while it's shortening, the activity is even lower. So that's a measure of what? Gosh, I can't hear anybody. You guys all need microphones. Sorry? Direction or velocity, okay? So yes, so the idea here is that uh, this fiber may be also saying how fast is it being stretched. And if you were to uh, do that, if you stretch it at different, uh, different rates, you would see that the frequency here would be in some sense proportional to uh, the rate of the stretch. And you can look at that here as well, the 1A and the 2 fiber. The 1A, if you just tap, you do a very short stretch here, you can see you get a very robust response here and some silencing here, you get less of a response here. If you oscillate it, so you're vibrating it like this rather quickly, you can see that the type two fiber tends to stay fairly constant because the average length isn't changing much, okay? But the type 1A fiber, if it's sensitive to stretch and shortening velocity, then you get high activity when it's being stretched here, here, and here, and you get low activity when it's actually being released here, here, and here. So as a extremely gross simplification, uh, and don't quote me on this, but uh, what you can find is that the 1A fibers are more or less proportional to static length, more or less proportional to the lengthening velocity. Those type 2 fibers are more or less proportional to static length. All right, uh, another way to say that is a dynamic responses and two are static responses. But what's important here is that this information is there. The, sp the spindle fibers carry information in some form about the length of the muscle and about its lengthening velocity. And that's all I want to say about the physiology today. You'll get many other talks the rest of this week. We'll tell you that's not true, but it's true enough for today. There's another part to the uh, sensory organs uh, that may not be obvious. There's also a contractile part. So here I'm talking about the big fibers, the meat of the muscle, and that's what generates the forces. That's what contracts. But if you also look just at the sensory organ, there's a part of the sensory organ that can also contract. Okay. The nervous system through the gamma motor neuron, it's a different motor neuron, it's a different neuron coming from the spinal cord, it can cause this end of this fiber to contract. So if you cause this part to contract and you keep the whole length the same, what happens here? So I have two elements in series and I make one of them get shorter and I'm holding the total length constant, what happens to the other one? It's a very simple answer. If I make this part shorter, and this part has to get longer so that the total length, if the total length is the same. So if this system were not to move, and I activate the gamma motor neuron, what is that going to say to the brain here? Okay, first of all, what does this say to the brain? What this says to the brain is if the muscle is sitting here, and then if an external force stretches the muscles, these signals are telling the brain, okay, my muscle is being stretched. Okay. And what happens when you stretch your muscle, usually? You've been to the doctor recently? You're sitting here and he does that? What's that? What's he testing? Reflexes. Okay, so what does the reflex do in this case? The stretch reflex? What is the idea of the stretch reflex is when the muscle gets stretched by an external force, the system wants to resist that force, so through a reflex loop, it's going to cause the muscle to activate to shorten again. So if something external is causing me to be stretched, I'm going to generate more force so that it doesn't get stretched and I'll come back again. What happens if I contract the part of the sensory organ here? And this whole thing stays the same length. This is hard without a drop board. It's as if the muscle is being stretched. So the brain can say to the muscle, here, generate a signal as if you're being stretched. That's a little bit weird, but basically what I'm saying is I have a sensory signal, I have a sensory organ that's under the control of the central nervous system, and that central nervous system can tell the sensory organ, tell the rest of the system that your muscle is being stretched, even though it's not necessarily true. So then the question is, so here we have uh, the afferent fibers, 1A and 2, they send signals about the lengthening position, length of the muscle and its lengthening velocity. And we have the efferent fibers, the alpha motor neuron, which causes the main muscle, the meat of the muscle to contract. And we have the gamma motor neurons that says uh, sensory organ to contract. And 
these activating the gamma motor neuron can create activation of these sensory motor neurons, these sensory uh, neurons. So, again, to just summarize very basic system motor system physiology, muscles have contractile elements. That's the part of the muscle that generates force, but they also have sensory organs. <clears throat> the contractile parts are innervated by the alpha motor neuron, but the sensory fibers, muscle spindles, can respond to length and change of length. And the spindle organs with the gamma motor neuron allow for the central modulation of the spindle output. Any questions so far? So then the question is, how can we generate, if, if we say that there's some feedback control going on here from this example, okay, so we assume that there's some kind of feedback mechanism going on, how do we generate that from that? So here's the idea that Merton had uh, <coughs> in the late 50s and 60s. What we're trying to do is we're trying to replicate this circuit where we measure position velocity and compare that to some desired trajectory, and that generates the forces that are going to cause the limb to move. Here's the actual circuit. We have the alpha motor neuron here, which causes the muscles to generate force. We have the spindle organ here that sends signals back up to the spinal cord, and typically through the spinal reflex, it generates alpha motor activity. And then we have this gamma motor neuron that comes down, and it generates this little contractile part of the spindle organ. So, how could that be used to generate a feedback system, a servo controller? How do we implement that here? Well, first of all, alpha here corresponds to the applied force. More alpha gives you more force generated by the muscle. Okay? This feedback here comes from the, the spindle organ outputs. So, these spindle organs are sending back position information and velocity information. So what's left is this part. And how can you generate this comparison between where you are and where you want to be? And Merton's idea was the following, is you could use the gamma motor neuron as sort of the set point. So if the gamma motor neuron is saying to the spindle organ, here's your rest length, this is where you want to be. Okay? This is where you want to be. And if you're not at that length, if something pull, pulls the muscle, the spindle organs here are going to generate signals, and that's going to generate poor, more alpha motor activity to bring it back to where you want to be. And Merton's idea was, well, then you could use the gamma motor neuron to tell the muscle where you want to be. So if I tell the, the, the spindle organ I want to be shorter, then the reflex loop here is going to automatically make the muscle contract to try and be shorter. So I have two, two properties here. I can either have an external force stretch the muscle, and if the gamma motor neuron hasn't changed, that's going to cause alpha motor neuron activity in order to bring it back. So it's going to correct for an external force. And if the central nervous system says to the gamma, make this muscle shorter, then that same reflex loop is going to make it follow in the same way that if I uh, tell the set point here to be shorter. So that's the idea. Uh, this is a, one way to, to implement a servo controller using the biological hardware. Right? And it sounded very good at the time. But then I asked the question, okay, so you can see how you could generate movements with this. What happens then if you don't have feedback? If you do feedback control and you don't have feedback, what happens? Goes up? Okay, it might go up. Another option is it might not go anywhere. I, I tend to agree with you that it might go up, but it certainly won't go to the end point, right? So you don't expect the system to work. If you're doing feedback control, let me see what my next slide is. And these are very... I'm sorry, this was just a summary. Uh, I'll skip it and come back. <clears throat> so if you cut this feedback here, then there's nothing coming back here in order to generate the muscle forces. If you cut the feedback here, no matter what you do with gamma or you stretch the muscle, if there's no feedback in coming here, there's no uh, alpha motor neuron activation. So f is there a way to do this experiment? And how could you cut feedback in a biological system? Drink Sorry? Drink alcohol. Drink alcohol? We could try that one. If you want to go all the way that far, <laughs> I'd be surprised. Another way? I'm sorry? 
you cut it, okay? And how is it that you can cut it? The nerve going to the, the muscle has both directions. You, what you want to be able to do, if you agree with me, you want to cut the sensory part, but you don't want to cut the motor part. If you cut the motor part, if you cut the alpha motor neuron, it will move because there's no way to generate force. So the idea is to cut just the feedback part but leave this motor command in place. And so there's a fortuitous situation in the spinal cord is when the nerve comes out of the spinal cord, here, down here in the nerve, the fibers going to the muscle that cause the muscle to contract travel along the same line as the fibers that come back that tell you the sensory information. But just before it gets to the spinal cord, they split. Okay, and so the dorsal root contains all the sensory fibers and the ventral root contains all the motor fibers. That's an exaggeration as well, and you'll get people saying, nah, there's a mix in both, but most of the that's true. And so what you can do here is what these experimenters did here is they cut this root, okay, with the idea being is you're taking away the feedback, but you're still leaving the possibility to generate force. Okay? And what happens? What do you think should happen? Surprisingly, or maybe not surprising for the people who did it, because otherwise they probably wouldn't have done it, uh, when they did this, here's the same experiment, the same monkey, although this monkey has been deprived of all sensory information from the arm. So not only can this monkey not see the arm, as I said earlier, this monkey can no longer feel the arm. So when you asked the question earlier, does the monkey not notice? In this case, the monkey doesn't, really doesn't notice. There's no more information that tells them uh, that the monkey, has, the arm has moved. Okay, and so here what happens here is this is the normal, what, after some training, uh, it would give, be wrong to say that the monkey just moving normally after having cut uh, all the sensory information, that would be dishonest. But if you give the monkey some time to practice, the monkey is able to generate this kind of movement without the motor being turned on. Right? So this is more or less a typical movement from the start to the position without any sensory feedback at all. And then we repeat the experiment where you use the motor to move the arm to the final position. So here the motor turns on. This movement is here. The arm is already at the final position. Okay? Here the arm is already at the final position. So you could say, well, if it's feet forward, I haven't cut the, the motor output. So if I did feet forward, I could still make a movement. But if I'm already here and I, I generate the same alpha activity, what should happen? Same thing we said earlier. If the, muscle, if, the, if the monkey is just learning to generate alpha motor activity to get here, you would expect this to go further, right? You say it would be full forward. And yet we've taken out all the feedback. So the question I have to you now is, this looks like feedback. you agree with me? The monkey is already at the target, manages to stay at the target, doesn't go any further than the target, okay? So there is feedback behavior without any feedback. So, how could that be possible? I'm supposed to stay in here, right? I don't usually play with stuff just for fun, but go ahead. Okay, so the, the key word there was the elastic properties. Okay, you guys are young, you've heard all this before, but back then that was pretty amazing. So here I have a couple of elastics. Okay, could you just uh, pull it to the left or to the right? No, the, the ring in the middle. So if you pull the system to the left or to the right, you pull it to the left and right, pull it to the left and hold it. Okay, now let it go. Let it go, release it. It comes back to where it was, right? So this system has a natural equilibrium that's somewhere between where the two elastics are. And so I can tell the system to be where we're at some position. And if I wanted to make a move, I can just change the rest length of one side or the other. And so that was the idea that uh, these guys came up with, which uh, really inspired me, is the muscles themselves have elastic properties. So if you look at here, you take a muscle that generates, it has some tension, you're holding this muscle here, and if you make it longer, the longer you make it, the more tension, the more force it generates, to some approximation. So, muscles have spring-like properties. Increasing alpha changes this curve. So, it's true that for a given length, if you increase the activation to the muscle, you'll get more force. 
But more important is, if you increase the alpha activation of the muscle, you shift this whole curve. Okay? And so in some sense, you can shift it so that it's as if the rest length of that muscle is getting shorter. It may also have a, some effect on the stiffness of that muscle. But the whole point is you can adjust the length tension curves. You can adjust the spring-like properties of the muscles themselves. You can put two muscles in opposition. And if you do that, it's like the two elastic bands. Okay? You can stretch these two elastic bands and find some equilibrium somewhere in between them. And so the system will want to stay there. And if something external pushes it off, it'll move back. But I can shift that by changing the rest length of one elastic or the other. And that's what's going on here. I have agonist and antagonist. And by shifting the alpha activities in those two, I can shift where that point is where they're generating equal force, where the system is going to come to equilibrium, tends to want to stay there. <clears throat> and so using that system, you can generate equilibrium positions using these, uh, these antagonistic pairs. And you can get the servo-like properties without any servo, without any feedback, without any neural feedback about what the length of the muscle is, you can still set up a mechanical system that has an equilibrium somewhere between the rest lengths of the two different muscles. So that's what's depicted here, is you have uh, the skeletal system, the inertia's here, and around that are the springs. Here, K is the muscle stiffness. This is the biomechanical properties of the stiffness. B is the muscle viscosity. What you can imagine what's going on is the alpha motor command is setting up these equilibrium uh, state between the two muscles, that generates an equilibrium position, and that's what the monkey is using in order to be able to move from one target position to the other. Okay, so that was the insight that came out of those studies. I don't mean to say from that that reflexes aren't important. Just to give you an example, this is a normal subject doing pointing movements like this. And they can do that quite well. This is a patient, and this patient has a certain neuropathy that is like what, what's happened to the monkeys, that they've lost their sensory feedback from the muscles. And those patients are, are able to make targeted movements. They can reach, they move their hands, particularly under visual control, but they can do it. But if you don't give them much visual feedback and you ask them to move, they're not as good as a control patient. So you, would, you can see that I don't ever mean to say that reflexes are not important, but they're not absolutely necessary as we saw by the monkey experiment. The other thing is here is you look at the properties of the stiffness of the muscle as a function of its operating force. Here is without reflex, this is with reflex. So you can see that the reflexes add to the behavior, the mechanical behavior not just the biomechanical properties of the muscles, it's not just their intrinsic stiffness or viscosity, but it's a system of biomechanical properties plus reflexes. And so this is the diagram we like to use here uh, to represent this. Here's the musculoskeletal system with its muscle stiffness and viscosity. That can generate an equilibrium, a stable equilibrium. And around that, you can close the loop and add some feedback, delay, feedback uh, information to the spinal cord. And those things uh, bring you to a system that has this servo-like properties. That is, you can do feedback control. You can specify a desired position. And this system will tend to follow what you tell it the desired position should be. And to take a step even further back, I presented this as a, as a discussion between feed forward and feedback. Of course, you don't even have to limit yourself to one or the other. Here is a more accurate uh, idea. You have issues to come up one by one, but you can have feed forward control where you calculate what you think is your best guess is what the motor command should be in order to generate that. And then you can, at the same time, measure what's actually happening, compare it to what you wanted to do, and make corrections to your motor command uh, based on that error. Good. Well, uh, if I understand it correctly, the biomechanical stiffness, this is a mechanical effect. It's just like if you pull on this, there's no delay, right? So the, it's a, an elastic spring. So the muscles do the same thing. When I was talking about the muscle properties, we're talking about what happens even if you don't change the neural command. So there's no delay to that, or at least there's you know, some biochemical delay to that. Whereas the, the feedback loops, the reflex feedback loops, it takes the time for the information to get from the muscle up to the spinal cord and back again. And that's not negligible. It's on the orders of tens of milliseconds because neural transmission is not like a wire. So, so, so I think the answer to your question, if I understand correctly, is the neural feedback is, is at a longer time scale than the biomechanical properties of the muscle. <clears throat>
So this is just to summarize. Uh, we asked this question just as a way of framing some of the questions we ask in this field. Uh, is it feed-forward feedback control? And presented the early evidence that yes, there is feedback uh, control going on. Uh, from these experiments with monkeys. I presented two out of three. I didn't present uh, Feldman's uh, equilibrium point hypothesis, but these are different hypotheses that are plausible, that how the neural system may be constructed in order to generate feedback-based uh, servo-like control movement. But I want to underline what's important here is the passive mechanical properties of the muscles. The stiffness, the elasticity of the muscles is very important. One, it's what allowed the monkey to move even though there was no neural feedback. But as you'll see in other talks, it's also important to be able to tune the mechanical system according to the task that you're trying to perform. So I think that's why I say yes. So I'll stop here for now. We're going to trade off. But first of all, do you have any questions at, at this level? I promise you it's going to get more exciting. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Maybe you should come and at least stand up. But uh, so, why do I say it's bio? Yes. I, I don't know. I, honestly, I just said that so I wouldn't say the opposite. But uh, there are people here who are experts in muscle physiology, and they will tell you what those delays might be. They could be nanoseconds. I don't know. What I, what I just meant to say is, when I was ans answering this question, is it's essentially immediate, right? For me, I tend to oversimplify and consider it a spring, and there's no delay. But I recognize that maybe it takes time for the, uh, the cross bridges to do something. I don't know. So we'll ask somebody better later in the week. Yep. Yep. Uh, the, the simple answer is the delays are, are non-negligible. The delays are not. So if you had a system where your actuators were force controllers, okay, and, and pure force controllers that had no intrinsic stability to them, and you close the loop with those delays, you won't get very high bandwidth. So you would not be able to do very effective closed loop control if that's all you were doing. Now, you could overcome that by doing feed forward control, okay? But it's likely that, uh, maybe Neville might verify that, or, but, but I think the delays are long enough that you are very limited in the gains that you can use. So it's, I think one of the important things is those muscle properties provide a stabilizing effect. Even if you're doing feed forward control, even if you're doing uh, reflex control, if you didn't have those intrinsic properties that are also acting at a very short time scale to, to stabilize things, your system would be much more unstable. You had much more trouble controlling it, given those delays. A robot doesn't have those delays, so maybe you don't care if you do a robot. But the, the brain cares. It has to care because those, those delays are non-negligible. Okay, so now you're asking, I had a whole other slide that I sometimes use. I don't say anything about planning here. So, and so that's a very good question, and it's a very active question in research, is if you imagine that the brain is generating a plan, a trajectory, where is that plan being generated? And you can ask the question, is, how is it being generated? In what coordinate system is it being generated? Uh, there's many, many questions. I don't have the answer to that. There are even people who say it's never being planned. The only thing that counts is the final position where you're trying to get and more sophisticated control algorithms that will drive you to that point. So I don't have an easy answer to your question. And I think the real answer is nobody really knows either, but it's a very active area of research. Yeah, I could then speculate, but I think I won't.